Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. If you've been following along in recent episodes, you know that I have been building out an R package that I'm calling Phylotyper. What does Phylotyper do? I'm glad you asked. Phylotyper will take a DNA sequence and then classify it by comparing it to a reference taxonomy to tell you what type of organism, specifically what type of bacterium, it came from. Now, if none of that means anything to you and you really don't care, I still encourage you to watch these episodes because I think you'll learn a lot about software engineering, building packages in R, as well as just a whole lot of good stuff about R programming, primarily using things in base R. Typically when I do things on these videos, I'm doing things in the tidyverse, and so what we have found is that the tidyverse is often slower than what we can perhaps do with uh, base R or some other tricks that we might have up our sleeves. That actually is gonna be one of the topics of today's episode. As I was getting ready to kind of put together a video to talk about submitting the, the package to CRAN, I was writing a short manuscript that I'm going to be submitting to the journal Microbiology Resource Announcements, MRA. As I was writing that manuscript, it's only about 500 words, not that long, but as I was writing this, I had a sentence that said something like, Phylotyper's performance is comparable to what we see in the classify.seeks command in mother. And I thought, is that true? <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of assumed it was. So what I'd like to do is go back and make sure that when I run uh, the classify.seeks command in mother, which implements the same algorithm, um, albeit written completely in C++, uh, it, within this mother package that my lab uh, also develops, I want to make sure that that isn't um, faster or uh, maybe it's slower <laughs> than what I'm doing with Phylotyper. I certainly don't want Phylotyper to be slower than what we can do with Mother, at least not by a whole lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by working within Mother to see how fast the classification of about 2,500 sequences takes with maybe one or four or 10 different processors. So here I am in my Phylotyper directory in my terminal. Mother is a tool that is run from the command line. If I go ahead and do ls, you'll see that I have two files for train set. One is the sequence file .fasta, and one is the taxonomy file .tax. These are the data that are included as a data object within the Phylotyper package. Um, and then I have myseq uh, sop.fasta. Those of you that are familiar with Mother know that this is a pipeline for using Mother. Um, basically, this is what the sequences look like right before we run classify.seeks. So I want to classify these sequences using what's in the train set. So we'll do it in Mother, and then we'll go do it with Phylotyper. So we'll fire up Mother, and then we'll go ahead and then do classify.seeks. Uh, FASTA equals myseq sop.fasta. Uh, reference equals, and I'm going to copy and paste just to limit my typos, and then taxonomy equals this. And then I'm going to do processors equals one to see how fast it runs with only one processor. Great. So that took uh, about a minute to run. So it took eight seconds to generate the search database and 14 seconds to generate the probabilities and then another 46 seconds to classify those 2,490 sequences. Um, and so that is uh, 68 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. So let's, let's go ahead and run that again. Uh, for some reason, the terminal gets all kind of wonky, uh, but hopefully this will work if I up arrow and then write over processor equal one to be processors equals four, and we'll see how long it takes to run with four processors. All right, so that took 11 seconds on four processors. So you can imagine 11 times four, 44, that's close to the 46. Um, good, and so now let's do it with 10 processors. All right, and so that took six seconds. And so we don't see a perfectly linear relationship, and sometimes these things uh, when we're down kind of single digit seconds, the timings are a little bit funky. Uh, and so what we're doing is trying to get something close to give us a sense of how long it takes to run. So now we'll go ahead and quit out of mother. So now over in our studio, I have my vignette open. I'm gonna go ahead and load uh, the Phylotyper package using DevTools load all. It's also shift command L 
Uh, that is the, the keyboard shortcut that I like to use. And so I will go ahead now and run the vignette to make sure everything works. Um, and I'll go ahead and do this library per on the set seed. We'll build the database. Uh, this again is the same database that we had previously. Um, you notice that takes a couple of seconds compared to the 22 seconds that it took for mother to generate the same database. So this is much faster, actually. This part is much faster than we find with mother. Um, I suppose we could test this if we did something like micro benchmark uh, and then micro benchmark, and then we could then plop in this, and then we could do uh, times equals, uh, let's do 10, and we'll get an average time of how long it takes to build the database and get the probabilities using our phylotype reversion in R. All right, so that completed. And we see that this is in units of seconds, that the median time was about three seconds, right? So I'll go ahead and write down three seconds for building the database in R. Again, within mother, that took 22 seconds. So we're about seven times faster already in R compared to what we had in mother. Awesome. Okay, so let's keep going through our vignette and running our code. So we then have this unknown sequence that we can load. We can then run consensus on that to get the consensus uh, classification, right? And so this outputs the different taxonomic levels along with the confidence scores, but we wanna filter that taxonomy to only use confidence scores that are 80 or greater. And so now what we'll see is that we got rid of that 54, which was obviously below 80, as well as the taxonomic name for that 54, which was Barnziella, okay? And so now we can also then do print filtered to get the whole uh, taxonomic string for this unknown sequence. Again, that is one sequence. And what we'd like to think about is how can we then run these myseq sequences? And I have something like that here, right? And so maybe what we could do is to build upon this. I'll go ahead and copy this down. And the uh, unknowns that I'm gonna load, I'm gonna call myseq and we'll do read underscore fast day. And so this is a function that we wrote as part of the phylotyper package. And as I showed you earlier within my phylotyper directory, I have these files. So I can do myseq sop.fastday. And so now if I look at head on myseq, I then see that I've got the sequences, the comments, and the sequence ID. So I need to modify this a bit because myseq is a three column data frame, right? And so what I would do would be something like myseq. So I'll want to pipe the myseq into per. So I will pipe this into mutate. And then for this, I will do classification equals, and I'm gonna put classification down on its own line because I have learned that my linter prefers it if I've got multiple arguments that go across multiple rows, it wants that first argument on its own row. And so this I will bring back here and then we'll go ahead and tab this over uh, to get things looking right. That should be good. And we're missing a parenthesis down here at the end. Uh, because I don't wanna take a whole lot of time if something goes belly up here, I'm gonna only look at the first five rows uh, to test things out. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Oh, and mutate, it doesn't know. So I'm gonna go dplyr on mutate. Um, so it's not happy because I have unknowns in here. Ah. This is what happens when you copy and paste. You gotta make sure that you update everything. So this should actually be sequence. Uh, so that all looks good. And so I need to be sure up at the top of my vignette now to put library uh, dplyr. And then in my description file in phylotyper, uh, I'm gonna go down to description and inside of suggests, uh, with per, I'm gonna go ahead and put dplyr. Okay, so that's updated, good. And again, let's come back down to where we were running that with uh, Phylotyper, running that with the MySeq data. We can now go ahead and remove this. Uh, one thing that I'm gonna do to give me a sense of how long this is taking to run is as a argument to per map chr, chr <laughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead in here and then do dot progress equals true. And so this should give us a progress bar 
to tell us how long things are taking to run. I am going to go ahead and use my phone to set up a, a stopwatch and I'm gonna go ahead and run this and see how long it takes to go. All right, so that spat out all of the 2500 classifications. Wonderful. Uh, that did take two minutes and 41 seconds. Whereas again, mother with one processor took 46 seconds. So that is uh, a lot longer, right? That's almost four times longer than what I saw it taking using mother. And uh, this is frustrating, right? So one of the things that we learned early on in developing Philotyper is that there are profiling tools within R to better understand where it is spending the most amount of time, okay? And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this block in a, one of those tools called profviz. So profviz uh, is the profviz package and the function we want is profviz as well. And so I'm gonna go ahead, like I said, and wrap that and maybe instead of using all uh, 2,500, maybe here I'll put in uh, 200 so that it's 200 sequences that it's gonna go ahead and classify. And that should give us a sense of where um, our classify sequence function is spending the most amount of time. Uh, the place that it's spending the most amount of time is clearly in calculating these column sums. And so we're using a special version of the call sums function from the rfast package. We, I think, covered this many episodes ago when we were doing optimization of looking at ways to calculate column sums. Um, and so I don't think we can improve upon the speed of the column sums. But something that I seem to remember from doing research on that previous episode is that there's a difference in performance between column sums and row sums. And so hold with me for a second, but if row sums are faster than column sums, that could be really cool, right? We still need to get the, the column sums, but the way we can get the same value out of a row sum is to take our matrix. So this conditional prob is a matrix. We could transpose it, get the row sums, and those would be the same thing as the column sums on the untransformed conditional prob uh, matrix. So let's go ahead and test that out here real quick. So the matrix that we can use to test out this row sum versus call sums is actually the conditional probabilities that we use in our database. And so again, if we come back up to the top, what we'll see is that we again had DB, right? And so if we look at DB, we have conditional prob as well as the classifications. All right, so I'm gonna do DB uh, dollar sign conditional prob. And here I'll do, I'll call this cond prob. Okay, and so this is our normal form, and then I'll do t cond prob, which will be the transpose on cond prob, okay? And so if we look at like the dim on cond prob, we see it's 65,536 rows, 1946 columns, and if we do dim on t cond prob, it's gonna be the opposite, right? Cool, so now what we wanna do is write a function to get the row sums versus the column sums. And so to do that, I'll do C sum uh, function. And then in that we'll do con prop and we'll use the rfast package version because that's what we're already using, right? Call sums. And I'm forgetting if it's call sums or call sum, uh, call sums, yep. And so then we also want the R sum and so we'll do R sum on the T cond prob, right? And so if I were to load these, they should get me the same result, right? So if I do C sum, that gets me all those. So let me do C sum and let's pipe this to head. That's good. And if I do the same thing, but with R sum to head, ah, that's different. And that's different because I'm using call sums rather than row sums, right? I think I heard one of you yell that. Good, thank you. And so now if we do R sums head, we see that R sum gives us the same value um, that we had up here for C sum, right? So we get the same value. So the question now is which is fastest, right? And so now we can then do micro benchmark, micro benchmark, and we can then do C sum, R sum, and let's give that a run and see how the performance differs. 
wow, <laughs> hey, uh, we find that R sum is about three times faster than the C sum, right? And I'm gonna guess that that transpose is pretty minuscule in the amount of time it's gonna take to run. Certainly it's not gonna take 40 uh, milliseconds to run. It didn't seem to, to gag when we took the transpose, right? So why don't we go ahead and see if we can take that conditional probability, transpose it, and then use that as our input to doing our classification. For now, we're going to put a pin in our phylotyper benchmarking. So I'm gonna start by going into my R directory, and I know that function to build the database is in kmers.r. That is this build kmer database function. And so what I would like is for my conditional probability, so calculating genus conditional prob, um, to transpose the conditional prob, this conditional prob, right? And so I want this to return a transposed version of um, the data, the matrix, right? And so if we now go look for the test, so I wanna get into the habit of changing the test before I change the code. So now if we go to test kmers, and again, the function is calc uh, genus conditional prob, that is here. And so what we would like is to make sure that conditional prob is the transpose of um, this, right? And so basically what we want is something like this, right? So that we've got our rows having the taxa and our columns having the kmers, right? So we'll go ahead and do that. So this is what we will get out of the function. And then this is what we calculated manually would return, okay? So let's go ahead and save that and test it. It should fail, definitely, it fails. And so what we see is that the subscript is out of bounds. Great, because we know that we uh, initially had a, like in this test case, a two column, two taxa data frame and a 64 row data frame. So we basically transposed it, but we didn't actually transpose it. We only transposed it in our tests. And so now we'll come back over here and we'll, we'll look for this function and we'll then wanna make sure that we modify that, right? And so now what we have is this, and this then will calculate the log probability. Um, I don't wanna mess with this stuff too much, so I think what I'll do here is to pipe this to the transpose function. And so that should work if we test it, that part of the test should pass. So now we get the same problem, or same type of problem, where our subscript is out of bounds, right? And so this is in test kmers 184.3, and that's right here, right? And so again, we need to move uh, basically the commas to get, uh, to basically, to, to so we need to move the commas to go ahead and transpose our expected results. And so this should be pretty straightforward. Uh, and go ahead and save and test. Start back at the top of our errors. We're moving further down. So 226.3, detect classification. Um, we're saying that DB conditional prob unknown kmers, uh, comma. And so that is probably happening within our classify BS, right? And so we need to go to classify BS. And again, that was in here. So we'll do classify BS, right? And this we know we want to be row sums and that we want it to be comma unknown kmers. Save and test. A lot of wash, rinse, repeat, right? Just to, until we get to the point where we are now where our tests all pass. So that's good and we're in good shape. So we'll go ahead and reload our package and then I'm gonna come back over to my vignette and let's make sure that the single sequence classification works as expected. And then our consensus, ah, and it's complaining because it's saying that our database subscripts are out of bounds and that's because I didn't go back and re load the da database, right? So I need to recalculate this build camer database. And then I can come back to loading all this other good stuff and doing the classification as we see there. Consensus looks basically like what we had before. You'll notice that this family slot is now 78 instead of 80. That's because of the random number generator variation. Um, and so we'll get a slightly different result here. Uh, that's fine and good. 
So now let's go back down to um, our prof viz. I think it's still going to be long in that row sum. Um, and you'll see that row sum is there, but it's actually a lot faster. Whereas before everything was call sums. Now, um, other things take, <laughs> take a decent amount of time, relatively speaking, compared to uh, that row sum. So good, I'm happy with that. I think that will make a difference when we then go ahead and remove the profviz. Um, and let's go ahead and use the full MySeq to make sure that it works. Um, and we'll see if this doesn't speed things up by doing row sums on the transpose rather than column sums on the form of the matrix that we had before. Wonderful. So that actually took about 50 seconds compared to the 46 seconds that mother took. I'm not so worried about that four seconds that again, when we're down to kind of individual second differences, that could be because there's other things, processes running in the background. We've certainly seen that with micro benchmark. The reason that micro benchmark does a hundred of these things uh, is because there's gonna be some variation between different runs. And so I think we're in pretty good shape with a single processor. And so I'll go ahead and put that down for 50 seconds. Um, and I think that is comparable uh, to the speed that we found with mother. The next thing I want to do is to build from this and see how we can parallelize. So within mother, we are able to use four or 10 or however many processors you want to complete the task. So if we have 2,500 sequences and we have 10 processors, we'd basically be classifying 250 sequences on each of those processors, making it 10 times faster. At least that's the hope. So let's go ahead and copy this. So the package that we'll use to do this, so we'll say, so again, we'll say fur, and we'll still use map uh, chr, but in front of that, we'll do future underscore map chr. And so uh, we'll go ahead and run this. However, this is only gonna run with one processor. We need to set R up to use multiple processors. So to use multiple processors, we're gonna use the plan function uh, that comes to us, I believe it's from fur. Actually, I think it's from future package, um, future plan. Yep, so multi-session is basically the jargon that the future package is using to set up the workers, the different processors. And so workers here equals four will tell uh, fur, uh, future map, um, how many processors to run. So we'll go ahead and load that. Uh, and I think I need to put quotes around that. Uh, and I'll also go ahead and put strategy because that's the argument that we're using here. Uh, strategy multi-session workers equals four will now allow us to use four processors. Uh, and let me go ahead and basically copy what I copy up <laughs> what I put down in the terminal. All right, good. And so now let's go ahead and run this and see how long it takes to run. So right off the bat, it is giving me an error. Uh, so let's see what it's saying. And so it's basically saying that the database, the, the, the data that I'm using is 973 megabytes, which exceeds the maximum allowable size of 500 megabytes. And so this option, uh, future global uh, globals max size can be modified, okay? And so we need to change that parameter. And so we'll do that now so that we can uh, trust or tell future to trust that um, we're using this bigger object that's larger than what it wants us to use. And again, the cap that it's putting is 500 and we're at 973. So we need to increase that. And so we'll set that with option options and then we're gonna grab this option that it wants us to use. And we'll plop that in here. I'm gonna put in a, a large number. So I'll put 10 uh, billion and now let's run it again and we don't get the error message and everything seems to be going swimmingly and we'll see how long this takes to run. All right, so we got another warning. Um, I think it's a warning and not an error. It, it certainly outputted the data. And so what it's saying is that it unexpectedly generated random numbers without specifying the argument seed. Now I had set the seed earlier in the vignette. Um, and so what it wants us to do is to set the option uh, in for futures to set the seed. And so let's go ahead and do that. So we'll then do dot options for options and then seed equals 1976 0620. 
It's my favorite seed. It's my birthday, <laughs> right? So this should then peg the seed for each of the four workers. So I'm gonna go ahead and run through these again. Uh, and it doesn't, <laughs> wouldn't you know, it instantly gives us another error. And that's because I left out the fur package on this. So that ran through without any errors, but it doesn't seem to be taking benefit of the multiple processors. So if I run just this line, I see that it comes up as sequential. And sequential is another strategy that Future has uh, for laying out how to use the processors. It basically does things sequentially, which isn't parallelized at all. And as I say that, I notice I have the argument plan here rather than strategy. So let's see what happens when we do that. And then I'm gonna do dot last value uh, to see uh, what it was outputting. And so we see that it's still sequential, okay? And so I think one of two things is a problem. I think multi-session might actually be a function. And so if I were to do like future colon colon multi-session and run that, let's see if that does anything different. Now we see that we get multi-session, right? So it turns out there's a couple ways that we could do this. So if we haven't loaded future, then we would need to say future colon colon multi-session. If up ahead or somewhere I were to do library fur or library future, I wouldn't need all this stuff. And in fact, I wouldn't need the quotes around strategy at all, right? So if I were to do like library fur, load that, I could actually get rid of that future. And again, let's see what it did. Let's see what it did on the previous. Again, is multi-session, right? So we're gonna put library fur way up here anyway. So why don't we just go ahead and do that and just not worry about it anymore. Make sure that's loaded, come back down, and maybe for completeness, we could include the future multi-session, but I think that's fine just the way it is. And in fact, we don't even need the quotes once we have loaded the fur package. So again, if I run that and I do last value, I see that I've got multi-session with four workers. So this is good. So <laughs> all of which is to say, Sometimes it's helpful to go ahead and load those packages or just be aware that multi-session is a function. And so it's looking for multi-session um, somewhere. And it wasn't doing anything, first of all, because I called this plan. And then it was complaining uh, when I was doing like strategy equals multi-session because it didn't know that multi-session was a function, right? Because I hadn't loaded anything or told it where to look, okay? Let's go ahead and rerun this pipeline and see if it doesn't do a lot better than 47 seconds. So that actually took about 15 seconds. So it's a little bit slower than I would think. I think there is some overhead in getting things up and running. Um, if we go ahead and let's say 15 seconds, and then if we go ahead and do it with say 10 processors, so again, we would do 10 workers, run this, and we'll go ahead and get the timing going. Uh, we'll go ahead and run that. So with 10 processors, it also took about 15 seconds. Um, I think what's happening is that there's a bit of overhead to going ahead and generating the workers and distributing the data to the different processors. And so for this size of data set, it probably doesn't make a difference if there's four versus 10 processors. So that's a downside of using this R-based version versus the mother version where we certainly kind of saw that economy of scale, where with Mother using uh, 10 processors, it took about six seconds, uh, whereas here again, it's taking about 15 seconds. So we're not really seeing any benefit. Let's see what happens if we do two uh, workers uh, to see if that maybe takes uh, somewhere between 15 and 45 seconds. So yeah, that took 26 seconds or so um, using two processors. So it does get faster as you use more processors. The downside, however, is you get to a point where there's just not a benefit to having more processors. Hopefully that makes sense. So going to four processors again, will put us around like 10 to 15 seconds, which again is comparable to what we saw using mother. So one thing I would like to do so that my users can make use of myseqsop.fasta is to include that with the package. So to do that, I'm gonna to come to my terminal and what I could do is I can have inside of my INST directory, a directory called ext data. So I already have an inst directory, right? That has the word list 
from the linter. Uh, so we can do mkdir inst ext data, and then we can move the um, myseq sop.fasta into inst ext data. So the problem now though, is if we go ahead and run that, it says that file doesn't exist. If I were to kind of load the package and try it again, um, it will also tell me that it doesn't exist, right? And so what we need to do is we need to tell read fasta the path to this file. If you head over to the R Packages book website, in chapter seven, subsection three, they talk about raw data files, right? And so this is exactly what we're doing. So the examples they use are for like the read R package that has like the read underscore TSV that they wanna be able to read in the limited files from an actual file. And so they provide users the actual files. And so I've done exactly what they suggest in putting it into inst ext data, right? Um, but then we need to figure out the file paths. And so they say if we use system file and then x data with the package read Excel, that we should get the files. So if I were to do, so if I do system.file and then ext data and then package equals philotyper, uh, that this is the directory, right? Um, but then I need to output it. So I could then pipe that to list.files. And that shows me my myseq sop.fasta, right? But typing all that for the user is pretty ugly. And so what they actually suggest doing is making a function, um, so pkg example. So the example they provide is from read Excel. I think I'm gonna go to their code and copy their code. So it's in r example.r. And so, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. We can do use underscore r, and we can do example. And so this creates our example.r. We can paste that in and then get path to philotyper. And I will do a find and replace for read Excel and philotyper. Okay, and so we'll go ahead and replace that, 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 that. So we've got everything. We'll go ahead and load that. And now when we come back here, and we can then in here, instead of having that big long uh, sys file and a lister, right? We can here then do philotyper example on that. And if we do philotyper example on that, this gives us the path, right? This gives us the path to myseq SOP. And then when we run this, we can then do uh, myseq. Uh, maybe I'll just get the first few rows. We'll do head and we get the first five rows, so that works. So this would be a, perhaps a lot more uh, elegant solution, and I could put some text in here uh, in my description of uh, this part of the vignette that this is where the user would put the path to their actual file, okay? But I wanted to be able to include something like read fast a to give them a sense of how they would get data into the packet. So I'm gonna stop here because this episode is already getting very long. Um, between now and the next episode, I will go ahead and clean up this vignette and make sure everything reads well before we are ready to submit to Crayon in our next episode. So that you don't miss that episode, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.